Chapter Two. Joel watched his father drive away. He felt betrayed, trapped. How could he explain to Tony that he had been kidding, that he had never had any intention of going with him to the park once the idea of climbing the bluffs had come up? Can I ride your bike, Joel? Tony begged. Can I, huh? Joel sighed. Tony was like a kid expecting Christmas, not someone about to risk his life. Just for the ride out, he said. When they came back, if they came back, he knew he would be glad for the gears on the Schwinn to make the ride easier. Tony's bike was a hand-me-down that had belonged to three older brothers before it had come to be his. There were no fenders, no handle grips, and only a few flecks left of the original red paint. It was perfect for wheelies, though, and for going off ramps. Joel's silver ten-speed could be ridden fast, or it could be ridden slowly, but it wasn't good for anything else. Joel reached over to take hold of Tony's bike, supporting his own for Tony at the same time. "Come on," he said. "Let's go." It took only about ten minutes to reach the edge of town. On their way past the school. Tony stuck out his tongue in the direction of the sixth-grade classroom where they had spent last year. Joel, deciding he might as well get into the spirit of the day, followed suit, though he liked school well enough. The sun sizzled in a sky so blue, it could have been created out of a paint can. When they left the town behind, they rode between stands of tall, whispering grass, rising on each side of the highway. Meadowlarks called from the ditch banks. Tony's exuberance knew no bounds. He rode in figure eights or in circles that occupied both lanes of the nearly deserted highway. Once he tried a square and nearly toppled off Joel's bike. Joel moved ahead, and when he started down the hill into the Vermilion River Valley, he leaned forward and pumped, pushing Tony's old bike until it hummed. This was the first of many valleys they would encounter, and Joel knew going up the other side would be tough. Maybe he thought, with a sudden rush of hope, Tony would get tired before they got all the way to the park. Soon the bike was going faster than he could pump, so he had to let it coast. Still, it gathered speed. He tried once to glance over his shoulder to see how close behind Tony was following. His front wheel wobbled dangerously when he turned his head, though, so he kept his eyes forward, concentrating on keeping the wheel still. His tires buzzed against the smooth blacktop, and the wind swept through his hair, holding it back from his face as if by strong fingers. It forced his eyelids open and made his eyes feel dry and crackly. By the time Joel got to the bridge, the lowest point between the two hills. He would be flying. With the speed he had built up, he figured he could be halfway up the other side before he had to get off to push. Joel reached the bottom of the hill and shot across the bridge so fast that he didn't get even a glimpse of the river below. He knew exactly how it would look, though, muddy red with lazy, oily-looking swirls. As soon as the bike's momentum slowed enough that his legs could keep pace with the spinning wheels. He started pumping, measuring his distance on the upward side, standing when the pumping began to get hard, so he could force each pedal down with all his weight. When his legs began to feel rubbery, he climbed off and started pushing. Tony would probably pass him, still riding the Schwinn. That was some hill, huh? He tossed the words over his shoulder, getting no answer. He turned around to see where Tony was. Tony was at the bottom of the hill in the middle of the bridge, the Schwinn leaning carelessly against the fat iron railing. He was hanging a long way out over the railing, peering down at the river. Bummer, Joel said, and glancing up and down the highway to check for cars, even when he was mad at his father, he couldn't help doing things like that. He U-turned. 
climbed back on, and began coasting again. Next time, he wouldn't get more than a few feet trying to start up from a dead stop at the bottom. He would have to walk the entire hill. But, of course, Tony didn't think of things like that. Maybe it was time they traded bikes back again. What are you looking at? he asked as he popped a wheelie and spun next to Tony. The river, Tony replied, leaning out even farther. I'm looking at Old Man River. No, you're not. Old Man River is the Mississippi. That's nothing but the Vermilion down there. Tony didn't answer. Joel knew his correction didn't matter to Tony. If he wanted to call the Vermilion Old Man River, he would. He was that way in school, too, even on tests. He drove the teachers nuts. Looking at Tony leaning over the railing like some kind of acrobat on a trapeze, Joel suddenly had to turn away. He wished Tony would be more careful. Beyond all reason, he also wished, as he often had before, that Tony were his brother. They could be twins, the kind that didn't have to look alike, or be alike either. With so many other kids in the family, the Zabrinskys wouldn't miss Tony. If they needed a replacement, Joel would gladly trade Bobby the whiner. You realize, Joel said, that it's going to be a long walk up that hill. Tony straightened up and grinned, his teeth bright against his already tanned skin. We don't have to go to Starved Rock, he said. Maybe I've got a better idea. Better than Starved Rock? Was there a chance he wasn't going to have to argue with Tony about climbing the bluffs? Tony did a little jig next to the bridge railing as if he could explain himself that way. We've got lots of time. We can do anything we want. Sure we can, Joel agreed enthusiastically. We could even go swimming. Joel couldn't believe his luck. All right, he exclaimed, holding out the flat of his palm for Tony to slap. Tony ignored the gesture and instead bowed, extending a hand in the direction of the reddish-brown water slithering far beneath the bridge. It's a great day for swimming, he said. Joel stared. In the river? he demanded. You want to go swimming in the river? Tony shrugged elaborately. Where else? You might as well go swimming in your toilet. Who says? My dad says, that's who. My dad says, Tony mimicked, his voice coming out high and girlish. Joel decided to ignore the taunt. He decided also not to remind Tony of the promise he had been required to make to his father before they left. You know we're not allowed to swim in the Vermilion. Nobody is. It's dangerous. Sinkholes and currents. Whirlpools sometimes. Besides being dirty. Alligators too, I bet. Tony was suddenly solemn, though his eyes still danced. The red in the water probably comes from all the bloody pieces of swimmers that gators leave lying around. There's no alligators in the Vermilion. Do you think I'm stupid or something? Joel could feel his face growing hot, despite the fact that he knew Tony was only teasing. And the color just comes from clay. Red clay. That does it, Tony said, crossing his arms and pulling his t-shirt over his head. If there's no gators and no blood, I'm going swimming for sure. Leaving Joel Schwinn still perched haphazardly against the railing, he went whooping the length of the bridge and crashed through the underbrush along the side of the road. He was swinging his pale blue shirt over his head like a lasso. Come on, Joel, he yelled back. The last one in's a two-toed sloth. Chapter 3